गुड इवनिंग टू वन एंड ऑल आई रवि जग्गा सेक्रेटरी इंडियन सोसाइटी ऑफ अर्थक्विक टेक्नोलॉजी वॉर्मली वेलकम यू ऑल टू द फोर्टी फर्स्ट आई सेट एनुअल लेक्चर ऑन एडवांसेस इन साइट रिस्पॉन्स एनालिसिस फॉर डिजाइन लेवल ग्राउंड मोशन टू बी डिलीवर्ड बाय प्रोफेसर एल एन दादे जेनेट एस कॉकरल सेंटिनल चेयर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सिविल आर्किटेक्चर एंड एनवायरमेंटल इंजीनियरिंग University of Texas Austin USA This event will be presided over by our ICIT president Professor TG Sitaram who is also director of IIT Guwahati Following our Indian tradition let us start our today's program by lighting the lamp as a tribute to Mother Saraswati goddess of knowledge I request our president Professor TG Sitaram for lighting the lamp on behalf of all the dignitaries to formally start the activity please sir Uh, now i uh, request uh, our president uh, professor tg sitaram for his opening remarks please namaste good evening good morning good oh. afternoon to all of you because i understand that there are a lot of people from all across the world honorable professor lm rajde today's distinguished speaker of 41st Indian Society for Earthquake Technology and your lecture, Professor B K Maheshwari, Vice President, ICET, Professor Ravi Jakka, Secretary, Indian Society for Earthquake Technology, and distinguished Executive Committee members, fellows, members of Indian Society for Earthquake Technology, student, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome all of you. to this 41st i said annual lecture it's my proud privilege and duty as president of indian society for earthquake technology to welcome you all to this 41st i said annual lecture i cordially welcome today's speaker professor rajje janak s kokrel centennial chair department of civil architectural and environmental engineering university of texas austin usa madam thank you very much it gives me an immense pleasure to all welcome i said executive committee members fellows and members of the i said other invited guests and students to this i said and your lecture presentation as you may be aware the indian society for earthquake technology holds an annual lecture along with the annual general me meeting every year which is delivered by an eminent engineer or a scientist in the field of earthquake technology this lecture will be printed in one of the forthcoming issues of the journal of earthquake technology published by indian society for earthquake technology the previous one was delivered by professor s k thakkar former professor department of earthquake engineering iit roorkee i would like to take a few minutes to speak briefly about the objectives and major activities of the indian society for earthquake technology the indian society for earthquake technology was founded by late professor jay krishna in 1962 who was its founder president i said honorary fellow late professor jay krishna was elected as the legend of earthquake engineering in the meeting of iaee during the 14th world conference on earthquake engineering at beijing pr china the objectives of the society are to promote research and development work in the field of earthquake technology to provide necessary forum for scientists and engineers of related specialization to come together and exchange ideas on the important issue of earthquake technology 
to disseminate knowledge in the field of in the field of quick technology dealing with scientific engineering aspects and to also honor the pioneering and meritorious contributions of the scientists and researchers in this area it also represents india on the international association of earthquake engineering iaee of which the society is a founder member the president and vice president of society for earthquake technology represent as national delegate and deputy national delegate respectively in iaee assembly the executive committee of iset also acts as indian national committee on earthquake engineering president iset is also executive member of the relevant committees of bureau of indian standards bis responsible for formulating various codes of practice on earthquake engineering the society publishes a quarterly research journal namely iset journal of earthquake technology and also a newsletter the society brings out special volumes from time to time such as advances in indian earthquake engineering and seismology contributions in an honor of sri professor jay krishna which has been published by springer society has printed 500 copies of the book guidelines for earthquake resistant non engineered construction authored by professor aryan in order to give recognition to good research paper published in the iset journal and other publications of the society for honoring significant contribution in the field of earthquake technology globally and innovative phd works several awards are available under indian society for earthquake technology instituted by its fellows and members and donors society organizes symposia workshops short term courses related to earthquake technology from time to time it has organized 16th four year plea symposia with department of earthquake engineering at iit roorkee about 28 symposia and workshops have been organized by the society so far including the 6th world conference on earthquake engineering in 1977 at new delhi india another flagship program of iset is organizing international conference on recent advances in geotechnical earthquake engineering and soil dynamic it is nicknamed as ikraji the 7th ikraji will be organized by iset during 12 to 15th of july 2021 in association with the indian institute of science and department of earthquake engineering iit roorkee i warmly welcome all of you to participate in that there is a already the proceedings of the conferences have already come out in six volumes i seventh ikraji is a continuation of the previous six international conferences which were organized at missouri university of science and technology rola under the chairmanship of professor shamshir prakash Emeritus Professor, Missouri University of Science and Technology, Rolla, USA. The sixth one was held in Delhi, and the seventh one will be supposed to be held in Bangalore at Indian Institute of Science. But now it is going online uh, from July 12 to 15, 2021. So I request all of you to join us because there is a fantastic feast of lectures by distinguished people in that conference. Considering the current pandemic situation across the world. organizing committee has decided to conduct this conference over the online platform using a three dimensional uh, opportunity so that you can go and see the exhibition and all the lectures in real time though the conference is going to be online mode we would make every effort attempt to conduct it in a much similar in a way as a regular mode so that you can interact with experts you can discuss with experts you know all that is would be possible in this new platform the same schedule announced earlier would be followed we will have the pre conference workshops keynotes parallel sessions we are also planning to make recorded presentation available to take care of any internet connectivity issues for the people who are logging in from remote areas we assure you of the best possible arrangements to make the event a memorable one to all of you and most beneficial to all the delegates of this conference further to encourage wider participation we have cut down the registration fee and make it affordable to all we also invite all of you to become the members and fellows of the indian society for earthquake technology and i offer this to all 
people today who are there, please connect with the ISAT office for doing the same. The current membership of the society, which includes the honorary fellows, life fellows, members, and institutional members, as well as student members, stands at 2200. ISAT activities are spread all, all over the country through ISAT local chapters. The society has 13 local chapters and two student chapters. These 13 local centers are at Roorkee, New Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, Chennai, Bangalore, Jorhat, Nagpur, Pune, Amravati, Gauhati, Vellur, and recently we started at Guntur in Andhra Pradesh. Guntur chapter has been inaugurated actually last week. The society has two student chapters, one at CBIT Hyderabad and the other at Vellur. More such centers are planned at some other places in the years to come. All those engineers, scientists interested in earthquake technology who are not the member of the society, I invite them again to join the society as members. So ladies and gentlemen, I once again welcome all of you to this annual lecture, which is 41st in the series. <clears throat> I thank all of you for a kind attention. Namaskar, Jai Hind. Thank you, Professor P.G. Uh, Sitaram, for uh, introducing about ISET and its activities to all the delegates. Now, uh, I request Professor D.K. Maheshwari, Vice President ISET, for introducing today's speaker, Professor Alan Rade. Please. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Jakka. I think I'm audible. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so I welcome uh, Professor Rajay for this uh, annual lecture. And uh, it is my proud privilege to introduce him, her, for this ISAT annual lecture. Dr. Ellen M. Rajay is the Janet S. Cochran Centennial Chair in Engineering in the Department of Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, U uh, USA. She is a Senior Research Scientist at the UT Bureau of Economic Geology. Dr. Rajya has secured both PhD and Master MS from Department of Civil Engineering at University of California at Berkeley. She has expertise in the areas of seismic site response analysis, seismic slope stability, field recurrences after earthquakes, remote sensing, and liquefaction evaluation. So many areas of geotechnical earthquake engineering. Professor Rajya's research has been funded by the US Geological Survey, the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the US National Science Foundation, the state of Texas, and the U UN Development Program. She is the principal in investigator for the Design CEF Cyber Infrastructure Project of the NSF-funded Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure. Dr. Rajya is a founding member and current steering committee member of the Geotechnical Extreme Event Reconnaissance Association, and she was a member of the board of directors of the Earthquake Engineering and Research Institute that is EERI from 2010 to 2013. Professor Rajya has been honored with various research awards, including the 2018 William Joyner Lecture Award from the Seismological Society of America and the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, and the 2010 Hoover Research Prize from the American Society of Civil Engineers. She was elected as a fellow of the ASC in 2016. With this brief introduction, I invite Professor Rajya to deliver this year, uh, year annual lecture, that is 41st annual lecture, uh, entitled as Advances in Site Response Analysis for Design Level Ground Motions. And certainly this is proud privilege that uh, so much uh, uh, imminent uh, speaker have uh, delivering this today's annual lecture. And I'm sure that this lecture is going to be be uh, much beneficial to all the who are attending this lecture. So my request to all of you, to stay back and uh, it will enhance our knowledge and uh, you know that uh, for research also. Thank you very much. And with that, I invite Professor Rajya. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pro Professor. Uh, before I hand over the floor to Professor Radhi, I would like to make a small announcement to the attendees. After the lecture, there will be a short discussion session. So attendees are requested to post their uh, question and answer questions and in Q&A. 
uh, option which is available at the bottom of uh, your uh, zoom screen with this uh, note i am handing the floor to professor uh, alan radhi uh, professor uh, alan radhi please wonderful thank you so much let me just get situated here yeah great um uh, well first of all let me uh express my uh gratitude for the invitation to be give to give this lecture today it's unfortunate that we can't all be together in the same room but i know very soon in the next year i'm sure we will all be able to get together uh, so today i'm going to talk about some work that's evolved probably over the last 10 years in my research group related to site response analysis or design level ground motions this this work was funded predominantly by the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission and of course uh was benefited by the the work of many graduate students who are listed here uh, George Zalakoris, Yu Meng Tao, Albert Potke and Bo Chin Shu. So let's put ourselves all in the same page here with respect to site effects and site response analysis. I know we're all very familiar with this problem uh, of understanding how soil conditions influence ground shaking. If we look at the earthquake process, we of course have the fault rupture, which generates waves that will travel to the ground surface. And that, and that path to the ground surface influences the intensity, the frequency content, and the duration of earthquake shaking. So we can look at the source effects, the long path effects as the tra waves travel through the earth. But as geotechnical engineers and engineers, uh, we're, we're often very concerned with the side effect, where the, the near surface materials, which may only represent one or two percent of the full travel path, can significantly influence the shaking. And of course, the classic example is from the 1985 Mexico City earthquake, where two ground motion stations were situated relatively close to one another still several hundred kilometers away from the earthquake source, but the SCT station was on a soft soil site, the UNAM station was a rock station, and you can see the time series how different the intensity, the frequency, content, and duration are. And if we looked at the response spectra of these two motions, there's significant amplification on the order of 10 times at some frequencies. This just shows how important it is to understand how the local soil conditions affect ground shaking. Now, of course, we need to predict these effects a priori for design, and that's where one dimensional site response analysis comes into play. And while we have a three dimensional system that we are trying to analyze, often we do make a one dimensional approximation uh, where we say we are going to model this near surface uh, system as just a vertical layering of soil layers. So here in these assumptions that we employ, we say that all, all layer boundaries are horizontal, they extend infinitely, and that the soil response is predominantly vertically propagating, horizontally polarized uh, SH waves. Yes, it is a simplifying assumption, but it makes it a much more tractable problem for analysis. When we do this one, once we've decided we're gonna go with this 1D approach, uh, we need to look at what's needed to perform the analysis. And so we generally have to develop a soil model, which involves defining the shear wave velocity, the damping and the unit weight and how it varies with depth uh, to some level of, of bedrock. And we can use that relatively simple discretization of the soil profile to define what we call a transfer function which tells us how the waves at different frequencies are modified by the presence of the soil. So we can see here uh, different peaks at different frequencies, which, res which represent the resonant frequencies at the different, um, uh, uh, for the different parts of the soil model, so for the different resonant frequencies. And this transfer function represents the ratio of the Fourier amplitude spectrum at the surface to that in the base. Now, when we try and run our site response analysis with this model of the soil response, we can take any input earthquake motion, transfer it to the frequency domain using an FFT, the fast Fourier transform, then it's simply multiplication of that Fourier amplitude spectrum at the base times this transfer function to define the Fourier amplitude spectrum at the ground surface. So you can see 
that rock motion may be a smooth Fourier spectrum. And now at the surface, due to the soil response, we see peaks uh, due to the resonant frequencies. And then given that Fourier amplitude spectrum, we can uh, use an inverse FFT and get this predicted surface motion. So we can then go from an input motion to a surface motion. And for both of these time series, we can also compute the response spectrum as I showed earlier. So this is like the most common way we run this type of analysis. Now, an important part of this analysis is how do we model nonlinear soil behavior? Because we know soil is nonlinear. Um, there are two basic approaches, the equivalent linear approach, where we define how the properties of the soil, whether it's the shear modulus or the damping, how those properties vary with shear strain, modulus decreasing, the damping increasing as the induced strains increase. This equivalent linear analysis is typically done in the frequency domain using the approach I outlined on the previous slide. Well, we know that that's a simplification of the nonlinear soil behavior, so we can also run fully nonlinear analysis, which models more faithfully the nonlinear hysteretic soil behavior. Um, and here we do nonlinear analysis where we actually try and track the stress strain curve in time, uh, but that has to be done in the time domain. So these are again most the most common uh, types of analysis we might run. Now, with that introduction just to site response analysis, let me outline the points and the, and the topics of my presentation today. So the first being, how accurate is that 1D assumption, which I said, uh, outlined at the beginning. Um, and we're gonna use small strain, low intensity motions from downhole arrays to investigate how well that 1D assumption uh, accurately models site response. But then moving on and realizing that design level ground motions induce large strains, we'll look at using large strain motions from similar downhole arrays to assess the accuracy of site response analysis for those large intensity design level ground motions. And then finally, after that, I'll end uh, promoting a little bit our tool that we, uh, we have developed for site response analysis called Strata. It's an open source tool. Um, that provides some unique capabilities that are not uh, available for, with other site response programs. So the first question is, how do you evaluate site response analysis? What data can we use to truly test the methodology? So one approach is what's called the surface array approach, where we find a recording on rock outcrop and a nearby recording on soil and look at the difference in the, reco the, the recording characteristics at these two locations. That's similar to what I showed you for the Mexico City earthquake earlier. The problem with this approach is it's really difficult to find rock outcrop that's close to the soil site. So it's the other, if, you don't, if they're not close to one another, whether they should be compared is questionable. The other issue is that sites that are considered rock at the ground surface still have their own site response because there's always a weathered zone, say near the ground surface. So, Researchers have moved towards using downhole arrays to evaluate site response analysis, where now rather than the sensors being um, located both at the ground surface, but away uh, uh, apart from one another horizontally, we look at them at the same basic site where different sensors are installed at different depths in the ground surface. And because this almost looks like uh, you can see that this is really testing that 1D approach because we're looking at a 1D array of recordings, it's really the most direct observation of site response that most, most faithfully is looking at the approach we're testing. And fortunately, there's been many downhole array sites um, installed across the world, but the most, um, the most insightful seem to be from Japan where they have installed through KickNet over 600 downhole arrays. And of course, there's many earthquakes in Japan um, and therefore we'll focus a lot on the KickNet arrays in Japan, but also some from other parts of the world. So now that we have, we, we're looking at downhole arrays, we have a recording at some depth, hopefully down in the bedrock, and then this surface recording. So we're, we have basically the input and the output to our site response analysis. So we can look at these uh, recordings and, and infer the empirical observed response. We can do that two ways. We can compute the Fourier spectra of each motion 
take the ratio of them, and that's essentially the empirical transfer function. Earlier, I talked about the theoretical transfer function. We can also compute the response spectra of these two motions, uh, SA, and then again, take the ratio, and we can look at the response spectral amplification, which I'll call AF. So the TF will be the transfer function in terms of Fourier amplitude spectra. AF will be the re response spectral amplification. So these are the observed responses. And then from our numerical models, we can look at the theoretical predicted responses, again, in terms of transfer function and AMP factor, and make these comparisons. So that's going to be our focus today. So let's start first talking about the small strain analyses where we look at evaluating the 1D assumption. So we're going to look at these six downhole arrays from some from Japan, Greece, some from California. And here's the shear wave velocity profiles down to the depth of the base sensor. So you can see there's quite a variety of site characteristics here. Um, depths between 100 and 200 meters. We see small velocities at the ground surface, high velocities, two to 3,000 meters per second at depth. Sometimes we reach the rock velocities at shallow depths, sometimes it's deeper depth. So these are good types to test our analyses. So let me focus first, I'm gonna focus actually on this Treasure Island site, very famous site in Northern California, uh, which is a very, a soft site underlain by relatively hard rock. So let's first look at evaluating the site response in terms of the transfer function, as well as the AMP factor. So the empirical data from the recordings are shown by the dashed lines. The gray just represents the range of, from many recordings. And then the theoretical transfer function using the small strain damping is shown in black. And you can see for the transfer function, we've got some very good agreement for the first three, four, five modes of uh, amplification. And if we look at response spectrum space, uh, we see a similar uh, excellent agreement. So this site you can see is very well modeled by one of these response analysis, which is very encouraging. However, when an engineer in practice needs to do a site response analysis, that site is not a, not a downhole array. You can't assess whether the site will be modeled well by 1D analysis simply by looking at data from, from your site. So the question is, how can we confirm, how, how can we confirm, say, a resonant frequency? How can at a site that's not a downhole array? We can't. If the site is not a downhole array, we can't do such a detailed assessment, but we can at least confirm that the frequencies uh, are coincident with our numerical model and our field site. One way to do that is to use a horizontal to vertical spectral ratio. So if we make recordings, these could be earthquake recordings, but they could also simply be noise recordings with a three component seismometer. We can, we can measure that noise over time, take the Fourier spectra, and then take the horizontal components, divide it by the vertical components. And for this site, what you'll see is that there'll be peaks, certainly it can be a strong peak at the first uh, natural frequency, and then also at perhaps even some higher modes. And the beauty here is that this, the peak of the HVSR coincides generally with the first mode frequency of the site. And the fact that we can measure this from noise as part of the site characterization really adds a lot of value to any of the shear wave velocity measurements you may be making. So for instance, if we look at recordings at Treasure Island and do the HVSR, of course, this never looks as clean as it does uh, in, in theory, but what's shown here in black is the average of several recordings. And we can see that there is a prominent uh, peak here at about 0.8 Hertz. Uh, there's a little bit of vari variation, but if we take that frequency and then superimpose it on the transfer function, we can see this coincidence of that frequency. So we took this uh, approach and did the same thing for other sites that I showed you earlier. Um, and you can see that the HVSR is shown in the bottom, the transfer functions are shown at the surface, and you can see here the frequencies are aligning very well with the first mode frequencies. So we analyzed actually in the in, in this study 31 sites 
And 24 of the sites analyzed showed consistency between the transfer function that was observed, the transfer function that was predicted by our numerical model, and the, H, the frequency from the HBSR. And that's 77% of the sites. So that's pretty um, encouraging to see that 77% of our sites were well modeled by 1D analysis. But of course, that wasn't always the case. And so here are two examples where uh, on the left hand side, we see a site that has a peak. And but when we superimpose it up here, we see that it does not match our theoretical uh, transfer function, and it doesn't even match. Uh, there isn't too much consistency with the empirical transfer function. Here in this site, another KickNet site in Japan, there's no peak in the HVSR. So focus here on the on the solid line. Um, and so obviously there's nothing to compare over here. And this site again had many a significant difference between the theoretical transfer function and the empirical transfer function. And seven of our 31 sites showed <clears throat> this type of behavior, where there was inconsistency between the peaks and the observed and predicted transfer function and also the HVSR. So if we think about what were the characteristics of the sites that seemed to be modeled well by 1D analysis, <clears throat> those sites all had a clear HVSR peak that was consistent with the theoretical transfer function from the VS profile. And if you look at the VS profiles, they tend to have a, a, a velocity contrast within the profile. And so this leads to that good 1D response that's well identified in the HVSR and in our numerical model. And a summary of this work is from uh, our 2019 paper in soil dynamics and earthquake engineering. The sites were, that were not modeled well by 1D analysis, uh, as I indicated, they either had inconsistent HVSR peak or no peak. It was unclear uh, whether this was because the VS profiles we had were inaccurate. Maybe there are some basin effects we're not modeling. Uh, maybe there are topographic effects we're not modeling. So maybe there are two or 3D effects that, that are not being captured. Um, and so the main conclusion of this work was that measuring this HVSR is an important component of our seismic site characterization uh, to further verify our VS profiles and also assess whether the sites can be modeled well by 1D analysis. So let's move on to looking at large strain site response analysis with high intensity motions. So this study, uh, we used downhole array data and we wanted to analyze and evaluate different types of uh, site response analysis. So the two I already spoke about, the equivalent linear analysis and the nonlinear analysis. So those are, are pretty commonly known in geotechnical earthquake engineering circles. But I'm also gonna mention a couple of <coughs> excuse me, other approaches that we that have been proposed to address some of the shortcomings of these type of analysis. And that is the equivalent linear analysis with frequency dependent properties. And then something new that we've been proposing is equivalent and lim, uh, equivalent linear analysis, where we then use a seismological parameter kappa to scale and improve the high frequency Site response. So I'll, let me, I'm going to introduce a little bit on these uh, two approaches. And then we will compare things, not in terms of transfer function. Now we're going to move to looking at response spectral amplification. <clears throat> and of course, we'll start with understanding low intensity as well then as large intensity motions and how well we capture them. I uh, will note for the analyses that we've run up here, we used our program Strata, which does equivalent linear analysis. And then we use the deep soil program from the University of Illinois to look at nonlinear analysis. So let's talk just a bit more in detail about the different approaches to modeling site response. So we know that the soil has nonlinear hysteretic behavior. Uh, if we look at uh, you know, a low strain uh, shaking, where we'll have a relatively stiff, stiff response where our hysteresis loop is relatively small. At those strains, we'll have <clears throat> large values of stiffness, low values of damping. As we go to larger cycles of motion, we're going to see that loop is going to bend over. It's going to get fatter. And therefore, the modulus, you know, as indicated by the secant stiffness, is going to go down. 
<clears throat> and the damping will go up uh, as related to the area of that loop. Now, nonlinear analysis in the time domain will attempt to track this hysteresis over time within the earthquake matrix. Equivalent linear analysis, as the name implies, we look, we're looking for an equivalent linear system that models the nonlinear response. And so that requires some iterations <clears throat> where we assume some properties, compute the strains. Uh, based on those strains, we realize we use the wrong properties. So we use those properties and we iterate until we end up with properties that are compatible with the strains induced in the system. Now, when we look at the, these analyses, and in particular large intensity motions, we see that there is this potential issue of overdamping of high frequencies for short periods when large strains are induced. So here's just a plot from a paper by uh, Kaplamanos et al. in 2015. So the observed recorded response spectrum in log-log space is shown in black. And you can see in red, the equivalent linear prediction, in gray, the nonlinear prediction. And you can see at periods below about a half second, we're under predicting the response, the response spectrum. So we're, we're, we may be doing good at long periods, but at shorter periods, we seem to be over damping. So our PGA is too low, <clears throat> our spectral accelerations in those frequencies are too low. Now, one approach that has been um, pro proposed to solve this problem is to use frequency dependent properties in our equivalent linear analysis. So let me explain what, what the conceptual framework is behind this idea. <clears throat> the idea is that high frequencies in an earthquake motion represent shear stress reversals that are stiffer and have less damping than say the large, larger strain, lower frequency parts of the motion. <clears throat> so this figure comes from Asamaki and, and Kalsel, where uh, you see a strain time history, a low frequency strain time history superimposed with a higher frequency cycles. And if we look at the stress strain response for nonlinear analysis, you can see the low frequencies associated with large strains are much softer than these high frequency cycles that are superimposed. <clears throat> so this implies that the higher frequencies should not be given those same equivalent linear properties, which would be assigned based on this strain level. So uh, Asamaki and Kalsel <clears throat> proposed this concept where we can convert the frequency dependence of the shear strain into a frequency dependence of the properties and, use, and we do that by using the nonlinear material curves. I want to clearly state that this does not mean <clears throat> that the material properties are frequency dependent. We're simply saying that the shear strains are frequency dependent and therefore the properties must be frequency dependent as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we have a shear strain time history, we can plot the uh, Fourier amplitude of the shear strain and you can see here at high frequencies, the, the, the strain is, can be much smaller. And this, this is a log scale. So they can be orders of magnitude smaller. And then if at each frequency, we come in with the appropriate shear strain and pull off the G over G max or damping, we actually then see at high frequencies where the strains are low, so the strains are low, we'll get large G and small damping. And at low frequencies where the strains are high, we'll get large damping and small modulus. And this can all still be done in an equivalent linear framework. So that's one concept to do to fix the high frequency over damping. Another approach, which is much newer and requires <coughs> some knowledge of um, seismology. So let me give you just a little primer here on this seismological parameter kappa. This is the high frequency spectral decay parameter, and it represents how quickly the Fourier amplitude spectrum decays at high frequencies. And as seismological um, considerations have shown that the Fourier amplitude spectrum at high frequencies is proportional to cap E to the minus pi kappa F. So this kappa 
controls how quickly this exponential decay occurs. And that means if I plot the Fourier spectrum in a very unique way, log scale on the vertical axis, linear scale on the x-axis, the slope of this curve is going to be represented by kappa. So we're looking again at the log linear decay of Fourier amplitude spectrum at high frequencies. We don't commonly plot Fourier spectra this way, but you'll see it's very useful to be able to see this linear uh, decay represented by this exponential function. Now, the reason CAP is important and useful <clears throat> is it can be relate, related to the damping and shear wave velocity profile because it's related to how much energy has been dissipated within the, um, within the path uh, towards the ground surface. And so if we know the kappa in, at the base rock and want to look at the delta kappa from the soil, we can actually, by looking at our properties that we're used to considering, we can relate it to the damping and the shear wave velocity. Um, and so we can basically, if you integrate the damping and shear wave velocity within your soil profile, couple that with the kappa at the surface, you have a prediction. Um, of kappa and that decay in shaking at the surface. So key takeaways about kappa, it controls the high frequency spectral shape or decay of the earthquake motion. It's a measure of damping at a site. <clears throat> and importantly, it can be measured directly from ground motion recording. So with this uh, preamble, let's talk, let's look at some site response analyses and evaluate them um, as a uh, relative to different levels of shaking. So we looked at about 11 different downhole array sites uh, from around the world. And I'm going to first just look at this one site from Japan. So this just shows the shear wave velocity profiles and the damping profiles we use in these analyses. And this work was summarized in our 2015 ASCE Journal of Geotechnical Engineering paper. So let's first focus at looking at response spectral amplification as a function of period. And first you can say, well, let's look at low intensity motions. We should do well here. So the gray lines represent all the recordings. The red is the average of the observations. Equivalent linear is the solid line. Nonlinear is the dotted line, and the EQLFD with frequency dependent properties is dashed. And you can see there's a really good match. Not, not perfect, but very good match, uh, all three, because the site is, rel is linear. So as expected there, all three analyses are very similar. But what happens when we get to much higher intensity shaking? So where the base intensity is say 0.2 G, you can see now the recordings are again shown in red. Uh, there's a lot fewer recordings, so there aren't as many gray lines. But you can see the equivalent linear and nonlinear analyses are much lower than the predictions. And again, similar to the previous example I showed, starting at about a half a second and below. The EQL FD seems to be doing it better at shorter periods because remember, <clears throat> EQL FD is using lower damping and higher stiffness at the higher frequencies or short periods. But it's not doing as well there in the middle period range. Of course, this is one site and just a couple of motions. Um, we want to be able to aggregate data across many sites. And we're going to do that by computing uh, residuals with respect to the amplification. So this is simply the difference in the observed versus calculated in log space. So it's going to be the natural log of the observed over calculated. Importantly, remember that positive values are mean under prediction. That means the observed is bigger than the calculated. I am always going to show positive residuals as red. Red being we want to avoid that because that would mean we're unconservative. Negative residuals represent over prediction because the calculated is bigger than the observed. So what I did here, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, I took these data and then just converted it into residuals. And you can see, for instance, 
At longer periods where things are pretty close, we can see that the residuals are close to zero. At the middle periods where there is an under prediction, our residuals are positive. And then there's a little bit of over prediction there at high frequencies, and you can see there's the negative residual. Okay, so just keep that in mind um, that the residuals are going to be different at different periods. So again, this just compared to what I showed you earlier, here's the small uh, strain data. But now if we look at the large strain, the, the high intensity, we've got the large positive residuals for nonlinear and equivalent linear. And then in fact, some negative residuals, a little bit of over prediction at large intensities um, from EQL FB. Now, of course, um, we, if we're trying to compare things on different sites and different strains, um, the intensity of shaking uh, and, and the strains induced are going to be different for each site. So rather than using PGA as an indicator of intensity, we looked at things in terms of strain because it's a better indicator of residuals across the sites. And so we looked at across all 11 sites, the mean residual for low strains, less than about a hundredth of a percent, moderate strains from a hundredth to a tenth percent, and then strains greater than a tenth of a percent. And again, you can see, yes, there's some variations here, but we're generally trending and, and vary, varying um, around zero for strains less than a tenth of a percent. But above a tenth of a percent, all of a sudden, again, at a period less than about 0.4 to 0.5 seconds, we're seeing a significant under prediction. So this is, this is a problem, and uh, this is for equivalent linear analysis. Of course, we want to do this for nonlinear analysis as well, and I'll show you those results in a second. Um, but to better understand this as a function of all periods and all strains, what we did is we averaged residuals across all 11 sites in 10 strain bins and 10 period bins. Okay, so here we couldn't look at bins. We could only we look at these kind of three large bins. This approach allows us to look at 10 different strain bins, 10 different period bins, and now the residual is shown by the color. Okay, so again, red is under prediction, blue is over prediction. <clears throat> Residuals in Lin space going from about one to negative one. But just to be clear, a residual of one means you're under predicting by a factor of three. Okay, so that's a significant difference. So let's take a look. I want to take you through this um, uh, plot. So the first thing you'll notice below 0.1% shear strain at all periods generally, we're in kind of this gray and white zone. That means you're plus or minus 20%. In earthquake engineering, if you're plus or minus 20%, you're good. But what you start to see <clears throat> then is this zone in this upper left corner, large strain, low periods, less than about a half a second, we see a lot of red, significant under prediction of ground shaking um, in this zone. Now, if we look at these amplification residuals now, not just for equivalent linear, but for nonlinear analysis, I think this was probably the first big surprise in our work, is that it's similar for nonlinear analysis. This idea that nonlinear analysis miraculously improves our responses at short periods and large strains uh, just wasn't borne out in the data. So we're seeing under prediction by both equivalent linear and nonlinear analysis at periods less than about a half a second and strains above about a tenth of a percent. Um, interestingly enough, EQL FD um, does, well, of course, should improve the response, but in some ways it overcompensates and we see blue in this zone. So it's actually over predicting the response, but in a smaller period range, uh, less than about 0.2 seconds. And that's likely due to the fact that the small strain damping is actually assigned at these high frequencies. And that small strain damping may actually be too small. Now, one thing that I want to emphasize is that when we assign properties for uh, site response analysis, we often just take that modulus reduction curve and just extrapolate it with our hyperbola, uh, hyperbola function and, and think that it's going to be perfectly suited. 
But we always have to think about the fact that most of the time our, our lab testing only goes up to about a tenth, maybe a half a percent strain. And we want to see what is the implied shear strength that we, we are using when we just simply take, say, a Darendelli modulus curve off the shelf. It's important to realize that this modulus curve, when coupled with a shear wave velocity, implies an entire tau gamma shear stress curve. So if we take um, the secant modulus at any strain times that strain, we get tau. And then we can use Vs, which represents G max, as well as that G over G max value at that strain to compute the shear stress at any strain level. So if, for instance, I have a site, and this is my modulus curve, I extrapolate Darendelli's hyperbola out to 10% strain, I have a shear wave velocity of 130 meters per second. Um, and let's just say this is at about two and a half meters depth, so that's my vertical effective stress. This modulus curve implies a very small tau of 10 kPa, I should say kPa, excuse me, not kilonewtons, uh, which implies a friction angle of 13 degrees, which as geotechnical engineers we know is far too small. So let's say we then can consider that 35 degrees would be a better estimate of the friction angle at that depth. We can modify the modulus curve predominantly at large strains so that we can bump up the curve here. And remember, these are the strains that are going to be induced by design level, large intensity shaking. So this is really important for uh, large intensity shaking. And so what we did for our analyses, those analyses previously, we took the modulus curves and we took those generic curves and we strength corrected them. What's amazing is that it doesn't take much change in G over G max space to change the shear stress by a factor of two, three, or four. Um, and so just minor changes here can change tau significantly. We left the damping curve generally the same. So let's see if that improved our results. So this is the original data I just showed you previously. Again, strain, period, but we're focusing on this red in the upper left-hand side of the curve. Um, when we ran the same analyses with strength corrected nonlinear properties, the first thing you notice is the maximum strain across the same motions is significantly reduced. So here for equivalent linear, before we were getting about 5% strain, now it's closer to 1%. Similar with nonlinear analysis. Uh, and even the EQLFD, induced, uh, the induced strains were reduced because the stiffness at large strains was increased. But importantly, we still see red in the common region. So this black area is kind of a common region uh, that are in both the original and strength corrected analyses. We still see red. The red's not as dark red, so that means the residuals are not quite as large, but we're still seeing this under prediction uh, for EQL and nonlinear analysis. The EQLFD relatively unchanged. So although strength correction is important, um, it still doesn't solve the problem completely. So looking at these analyses, you can see after about a half a percent of strain, the red is really severe. And so you're getting severe under prediction that we have to con uh, consider inaccurate. Why is this happening? Um, and why is it happening in nonlinear as well as equivalent linear? It's really a base isolation effect. If you think about a 1D analysis, and this hyperbola, the stress strain curve that we're modeling, at some point, when you start to mobilize the strength, the shaking cannot continue to go through to the ground surface. And my student simply looked at taking the same motion and increasing the intensity and then plotting what's the PGA at the ground surface. So in the beginning, obviously, as the PGA of the base goes up, the PGA at the surface goes up. That's a little different for nonlinear and equivalent linear analyses. But what you start to see is at some level of shaking, when the strength is mobilized, you cannot get any more PGA to the ground surface. You could hit this with 10 G, you're not gonna get more than this value of PGA at the ground surface. The issue is the real site is not an infinite 1D system. 
But when you assume an infinite 1D system, it basically base isolates. In the, in the, in the field, it's not going to base isolate because there's material over here that may be stiffer and the, the waves can get around. So this is not realistic uh, and not supported by the field data. So observations here from this part of the study is that equivalent linear and nonlinear analyses under predict motions at strains greater than about a tenth of a percent, periods less than about a half of an, uh, a second. The strength correction is important and improves the results, but does not fully remove the bias. And that under prediction can be as much as 50%. Uh, EQLFD seems to overcompensate, um, and um, that overprediction and, and overpredicts the motions at short periods. And that overprediction may be as much as 25%. What should you do uh, at these larger strains? I indicate that equivalent linear or nonlinear analysis should not be used when the strains are greater than a half a percent. Now, when this study was presented and we published it in 2015, I would have said the equivalent linear frequency dependent method was preferred. But since that time, we've started to look at this kappa parameter and seeing whether it can help. So um, moving on, uh, let's talk just a little bit about kappa. And first of all, understanding what does our equivalent linear analysis say about how kappa changes as the intensity of shaking increases. Um, so what we did is we took our site response analysis, equivalent linear site response analysis for a hypothetical site. We ran low intensity motions and high intensity motions. And then we looked at the slope of the Fourier amplitude spectrum in kappa to see how things change. Now, I mentioned earlier, kappa is related to damping. So kappa should increase with strain due to larger damping. So here's the surface Fourier spectrum. Remember I mentioned log linear, the slope represents kappa. So if we look at low intensity shaking where the PGA is only 0.04 G, we measure the slope, the kappa is about 0.043 seconds. When we ran a high intensity motion with 0.8 G, we get a kappa of 0.15 seconds. And so if we plot that kappa versus strain, you see this increase, and we're only up at about 1% strain at this point. Um, but you're seeing an increase in kappa of a factor of three. So if this is true, if our site response analysis is correct, if we look at earthquake recordings, we should see kappa increasing with strain by you know, you know, factors of two, three, or even larger. So the question was, can we go look at earthquake recordings to confirm whether this behavior is observed? And we did that by looking at data from Japan again for different sites. And so here's the kappa measured from the surface recordings as a function of shear strain. These are the small strain recordings. These are the large strain recordings, so a 10th to 1%. They're scattered in even the small strain data, but what, you, what the biggest takeaway here is that the small strain kappa and the large strain kappa were statistically indistinguishable. That means kappa does not appear to change with intensity um, as implied by our site response analysis. And in fact, when we looked at many thousands of motions over 32 sites, if we plotted kappa over the small strain kappa, so remember for that plot I showed you from the site response analysis, the data should go up to like three as we go to larger strains, the data, sure, it's a shotgun blast, but the key is the average is close to one. Kappa is not changing. So this tells us that the small strain and large strain kappa should be the same. And this, in, this agreement from this recordings indicates damping should remain at a close to the small strain levels at high frequencies for large strain motion. So this supports the EQL-FD approach. But the EQLFD approach, as we saw, does tend to overpredict sh uh, shaking. So we said rather than using the EQLFD approach, what if we could just scale with a known kappa, small strain kappa, the EQL prediction? So what's shown here is some results from an equivalent linear analysis, Fourier spectra, log, frequency uh, on a linear axis, 
And you can see here's the equivalent linear um, Fourier spectra at the surface, and it's got a, lar a relatively large kappa of 0.11. The recording for this site, this is a downhole array, shows a much smaller kappa, about half that value, a little bit less than more than half that value. So what if we took the equivalent linear prediction, if we know the target kappa, we can simply scale it with that exponential function I talked about previously, and that we can apply the scale factor to the, the Fourier spectra from equivalent linear analysis to shift it up. So it's a frequency dependent scale factor. So this is what we call kappa scaling towards a small strain kappa target. And there, in a recent paper, we outlined different ways that you could come up with that target kappa. So uh, if we apply that frequency dependent scale factor, you can see the kappa scaled equivalent linear analysis as uh, this thin black line much better uh, relates, uh, agrees with the recording, which is shown in the, in the empirical uh, thicker black line. And in fact, I'll, very quickly, these are response spectra in frequency space. The equivalent linear analysis without kappa scaling, again, underestimating. Again, I'm showing you some frequencies, so these response spectra are going to be flipped compared to the ones I showed previously. Um, so under predicting the recording, the kappa scaled is much closer. And the EQLFD is also shown here, and it's actually over predicting. So again, similar to what I'd shown previously. So we then went back and did a residuals analysis I showed you before for uh, another six downhole array sites, bringing in this idea of kappa scaling. And so um, I have to apologize because different student plotted things differently, but this is a similar plot, shear strain axis, but now frequency instead of period to where the red was in the upper left corner. Now the red is in the upper right corner because we're high frequencies that represent short periods. So again, similar to before, we are under predicting. We've got red in the high frequency large strain zone. Uh, EQLFD over predicting in that zone and even more so for these sites. But when we did the kappa scaling approach, the most important takeaway is almost all frequencies were in that gray zone, the gray to white zone. That means we're plus or minus 20%, we're pretty good. Yeah, there are pockets of blue and red, but they're not systematic, where here we've got systematic zones of where everything is red or blue. So based on that, um, we again saw similar concepts of each equivalent linear analysis under predicting at large strains and shorter periods, but the kappa scaling provides the most unbiased results over the broadest frequency and strain range. And that's why we are now, uh, recommending that this kappa approach which requires us to understand a little bit more seismology is best used to correct the the high frequencies when large strains are predicted okay um i'm just going to very quickly because i realize i'm already at about 47 minutes i just want to mention our strata tool um this was done with my phd student albert cocky it's maintained at this github site um we also have their uh a Python package of strata functions called PySRA that's also available at this GitHub site. Um, the unique capabilities of strata is that you can run equivalent linear analysis. You can run the EQLFD, which is what I talked about earlier. Uh, you can run your traditional time series analysis, but another approach which people may not appreciate is this RVT approach, which allows you to perform analyses without selecting time series. And the other thing that Strata allows you is uh, to do Monte Carlo simulations. So you can statistically vary your shear wave velocity profiles, your layering, your nonlinear properties, et cetera. And it's really very user-friendly in terms of take you through the tabs and you know, the types of analysis. It's all got a nice GUI, uh, all the things you're used to from shake type of analysis. And what's nice is the results are quickly plotted and easy comparisons across all the motions. So I, I think I'm going to skip through the RVT stuff, except to say that you can just simply use a response spectrum to uh, as a, your input motion, and, and you can read some of our papers on the RVT approach uh, if you want to become more familiar with that. So let me summarize um, the main findings that, and, and takeaways from this presentation. 
Uh, first of all, that HBSR is an important component of site response analysis and I think should always be included and used to evaluate the shear wave velocity profile <coughs> and the peak and the natural frequencies indicated by the shear wave velocity profile. Um, I want everyone to realize that 1D site response analysis can underpredict ground shaking at shorter periods <coughs> for strains greater than about a tenth, and maybe you can push it to a half a percent shear strain. This is true for both equivalent linear and nonlinear analysis. Uh, we should always strength correct our modulus curves um, to improve uh, our results at small at large strains. But that does not it mean that it will fully improve things if the largest strains are induced. <clears throat> and uh, we need some improvement at strains greater than a half a percent. <clears throat> um, EQLFD is one option to improve uh, the response at larger strains, but they can overpredict shaking. So that uh, is something to keep under mind, keep in mind. Um, and the kappa scaling of surface motion. Uh, I believe provides the most unbiased site response results for large strains and, and should be considered and further investigated as a way to improve large strain site response. And please check out our strata software. Uh, it's open source and, and it's free to use to everyone. So I think I will stop there and thank you all for your attention uh, during this presentation. Thank you. Uh... Professor uh, Alan Rade for delivering such an exciting and thought-provoking lecture. Yeah, like I initially I thought uh, to summarize, but you you are the best person to summarize. You summarize <laughs> nicely at the end. So thanks. It is uh, like a very interesting topic, and uh, we do working a little bit on uh, side effects and all. But a lot of stuff I came to know from new stuff from you and. We routinely carry out the ground response analysis, uh, but you enlightened us how we can uh, verify the results, whatever we are getting from theoretical ground response analysis using simple HESR technique. And also like so nicely you pointed out the issues at uh, high strains. Uh, very often like high frequency, uh, the peaks at high frequencies we couldn't able to match. And uh, for the first time I came to know the reason and um, the other thing is uh, mostly we think that nonlinear analysis is the solution to take care of the issues. But from your lecture and from your research, it is very clear that it is not. So even nonlinear analysis cannot be able to predict well, like until unless we take care of the issues. And nicely you told us how we can um, use equivalent uh, ground uh, linear analysis uh, with uh, uh, kappa correction and other things uh, to better match our results. So it is so nice. And of course, uh, to in order to you use this new techniques, uh, we need to certainly understand the seismology and other. But fortunately, I think you you as you said you have already implemented these things in strata i think which uh, you have you're sh kindly sharing this even the source and uh, python course with uh, uh, openly so i think it is going to be helpful to all the researchers who are working in this area and it's uh, totally enlightening i'm sure all the participants and uh, attendees would agree certainly that it is uh, an excellent lecture let us show our appreciation by uploading our honorable speakers yeah, it is a like online mode. They are they cannot directly uh, <laughs> participate. But on behalf of all the participants, uh, we thank you very much. And uh, now uh, I will pose some of the questions. Uh, raised it by our uh, uh, attendees, and uh, there are a couple of lots questions. of questions. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so one uh, question is um, regarding uh, carrying out of uh, 1D uh, site response analysis uh, for the deep soil, uh, deep, deeper strata, such as in, in our Indo-Gangetic uh, plains, yes, uh, yes. Is two kilometers. So can we still use uh, 1D uh, uh, equivalent linear analysis? That is, that is, that, a that is an excellent question. So how deep can you run 1D site response analysis? Uh, I know of no data available to test whether we can use it that deep, but I will say that we've been using it down to five kilometers um, in, in some uh, 
uh, nuclear projects that, we're, that we have been using, uh, doing in Taiwan and the US. But I have to say it has not been evaluated. I mean, there's certainly, um, you know, as you go down that deep, uh, particularly if the source is close, the vertical propagation, uh, uh, you know, the fact that the, the waves are vertically propagating, they're go probably gonna be inclined. Um, but but we have been using it, so I, I I don't think there's a better option. I think I think I think that you 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 should you can use it down that deep. The hardest part is trying to define the properties that deep because uh, it's hard to get samples, in particular the nonlinear properties and the damping. So um, yeah, there is another question: uh, How uh, to assess the vertical ground uh, vibrations? Uh, that, another great question. Um, so we, we just struggled with this for a nuclear project in Taiwan because we, 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 had vertic we had to specify vertical motions for very high intensity shaking, right? So again, Taiwan is very seismically active. Uh, we were talking about two or three G ground shaking levels as input. And traditionally, we have not trusted vertical site response analysis, right? So, so when we do... Uh, 1D uh, site response analysis for hor horizontal, we're just saying the waves are horizontal shear waves. So theoretically, if the vertical is P waves, you can just take VP and somehow define how VP changes nonlinearly and do vertical propagation of, of vertical waves. The problem is the vertical motion is not necessarily all P waves. There are PSV waves, right? So there's, 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 um, shear component as well. And in the end, what we did is we looked at vertical to horizontal ratios. Um, and that, so we feel confident in site response um, for horizontal motion to come up with the vertical motion. There's been a lot of work in the nuclear industry to look at how the vertical to horizontal response spectral ratio varies with period. It's not a constant, it's not some two thirds factor. Uh, but we use that V over H ratio as a function of period to transfer a horizontal spectrum to a vertical spectrum. And I will say that's still the way it, it, it will be done, not vertical site response analysis. Okay, thank you. There is another interesting and practical question. Uh, very often we struggle uh, to select the ground motions for carrying out the ground response analysis. In whenever we want to obtain the uniform hazard spectrum or any other spectrum, uh, normally uh, many people, like as I know from our colleagues, seismologists, they obtain directly using the attenuation relationships. So if the attenuation relationship can take care of the side effects, what is the point in carrying out the ground response? analysis and if so how to select the motions required to carry out the ground response analysis so i think if you look at ground motion prediction equations and yes they have side effects but they're very general right it's in function of vs30 and maybe a depth to some velocity and and it's all empirically based and it's uh, or even if there's some numerical analysis behind it it's for a range of site conditions. So I think when you want the actual response of your site where you know the detail, that's why you wanna do site response analysis. Um, then the question is how do you pick motions to run the site response analysis? Um, if you're gonna run time series analysis, you've gotta find time series that fit some sort of target spectrum, as you mentioned. So maybe a UHS, maybe a response spectrum from a GMPE. Um, downloading motions. You know, we've written a paper on this. Um, and in fact, Albert Kaki and I also wrote a program called Sigma Spectra that helps if you pull a bunch of data from the peer database and try and fit a target spectrum, it'll automatically try and find the best motions. Um, so that was a paper we published in 2008, I think. And, and that program, Sigma Spectra, is also available at that GitHub site. So, so I, I mean, I could do an entire presentation on how to select motions. But I will, I do want to say one thing. RVT gives us a lot of power to say, if I just have the response spectrum, I can actually do a pretty dang good job with one motion. And I'd rather you, you use RVT, one motion, than five bad motions that you'd pick that didn't fit the response spectrum. So um, you could take a look at some of the RVT stuff as well. Oh, thank you, Professor Ellen. Like, uh, if you can deliver another lecture sometime on our <laughs> platform, we'll be happy to hear. This is a very practical uh, issue. 
uh, for all the um, practicing engineers. Uh, there is uh, one question uh, that is. Uh, can, can I uh, make sure? I, I just want to mention because someone actually asked me about Design Safe. I do want to. Um, Design Safe is our cyber infrastructure platform. Ravi mentioned it in the intro. Oh, no. Uh, Professor Mashrawari mentioned it in the introduction. Um, anyone can use Design Safe. You can publish data, you can use data, you can use some of the tools there, uh, our Jupyter Hub, et cetera. So check it out. That's all I want to say. Check it out. It's open to the global earthquake community and natural hazards community. Okay. Uh, Professor, there, there is another question. Uh, hmm. At what uh, strain level uh, site response analysis should be terminated and why? Uh, I think you partly addressed um, maybe more clarif clarification. Yeah, is, uh, yeah. This is, this is really hard and this is really why um, working and consulting is so illuminating. So I'm going to talk about that Taiwan project again where we were compute, we ran analyses, we're getting 10% shear strain, we're getting 20% shear strain. Um, and, and it really made us think about strength, understanding the large strain properties. So the first thing is, I, I, I'm not gonna answer this and say you must terminate at a half a percent or 1%. I think if you get large strains, you need to really think about what the strength is, first of all. And then second of all, it's okay to run it at large strains that go beyond a half a percent, but then realize some modification to the high frequency part of the response is going to, going to be required. And that's still an active area of research on how to do that. Um, and I have a new PhD student who will be starting on that uh, just in the next couple of months. Yeah, there are um, more questions. Uh, I. I... Like, if you permit, I can go with one or two more. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, there was one question. Uh, it says, uh, what's your opinion about using uh, records from downhole array? Since there is a risk of interference uh, between upcoming and down uh, going waves. So you, in yeah. fact, in your presentation, you mentioned about downhole array. So it is very relevant to you. So um, I will say I've been perplexed a bit by this upcoming and downgoing wave effect because what we've seen is that some sites, um, our model of, you know, because when you have a downhole array, that downhole recording has upgoing and downgoing wave effects. So you have to use a certain within boundary condition uh, for that. And some sites that model works really well. Other sites, if you're not in the hard rock, our site response analysis doesn't look anything like um, the recordings. And so if I'm doing a research investigation and I can say, okay, yeah, you know, I, I can use some judgment on whether, how to model that upcoming and downgoing wave. But if you're doing a site response analysis for practice, you have no idea about what you should do because you don't have their surface recording to evaluate whether the <clears throat> downgoing wave is truly there. So I would not recommend of using downhole array recordings uh, for site response analyses for practice. I would only use surface recordings. Yeah. Another question in slide uh, 18, uh, you said that uh, spectral acceleration was used. My question is that should we use the spectral displacement instead of acceleration? Because that low frequency reflects displacement characteristics than acceleration? So um, absolutely, you will see bigger differences um, they, um, at low, well, sorry, let me start again. I wanna make sure I understand the question. So certainly spectral displacements are larger at low frequencies, long periods. And you know that I would say that's a structural engineer's assessment of how you should do uh, uh, structural design um, and whether you, there's the displacement based methods versus the force based methods versus on SA. Um, so it, it absolutely depends on your structure. Um, and and uh, I, I don't want to really talk about the, the benefits because I'm not a structural engineer on whether you should use displacement based design or spectral acceleration design. But I will say that we are finding at longer periods the site response analysis seems to do pretty well. 
uh, it's the short periods. And that means the shot, the, these are, you know, stiffer structures, shorter structures that are most concerning. Um, or say a liquefaction analysis where you're interested in P PGA. Yeah, I would uh, stop with one small uh, question, which may be useful to many of us. That is, uh, you talk about the new correction, kappa correction. Uh, yes. can we, yeah, can we incorporate kappa correction in strata or deep soil? Oh, that is such a great question. The answer is no, unfortunately. Um, it's, and it's something we need to, I think we need to figure out how we want to do the analysis before we develop a tool that does, because there are, we're still looking at some different iterations, but it's not really that hard. If you feel like, you know, if you're comfortable in MATLAB or Python and you can compute a Fourier spectrum, all you do is you can, you scale up the Fourier spectra and do an inverse FFT and you're done. Um, so, um, it's the, the short answer is no, it's not available. Um, but it'll be coming, but I think it'll be a while because we're still fiddling with the details on how to implement it. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, before I propose vote of thanks, uh, I would like to re um, uh, request uh, our panelists if they want to add any comments, quick comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Jacka. Yeah, this was really very interesting lectures. Though we have uh, studied ground response analysis, mostly, you know, that's uh, from Kramer and uh, other, like, you know, some papers. But uh, the insight which uh, Professor Rajay has put up for related to many issues, whether nonlinearity or whether effect of frequencies or then kappa effect, so many things are there. So really it is interesting. And I don't know whether uh, you can check with the speaker if uh, this copy of the, like, you know, this can be put up this, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, this presentation on our website or that could be, I mean, uh, that is a uh, prerogative of the speaker. So you can check with that. So that could be very useful. And not only that, I think this was the first online lecture of ISAT annual lecture. So far we have <laughs> offline and you could see the number of participants are more than the offline. So that, that is very <laughs> interesting and uh, many people could connect. Thank you very much, Professor Rajay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Sir. you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Professor uh, Ellen Rathje. It was a fantastic uh, lecture. I really enjoyed it. I have only one very general question. Now, the topography effects are intimately connected with the, the soil profile. So, for, uh, for a particularly for structures which are running kilometers, for example, pipelines or dams, you know, uh, how do you really do the site response analysis? Okay without uh, really considering these topographical effects. So what is the reality, whether you would recommend to go to 2D, 3D, or, or uh, there is some way of handling the Thank you. That, I mean, that is a great question. And it's one where I have to acknowledge that our profession has just like we dance around it because it's such a hard problem. I mean, you can do a 2D analysis. You can do a 3D analysis. The, the models are there. The computational resources are there but that they don't seem to agree well with ex either field data or experimental data. The, the simulations don't match well. Um, and so there's a lot more work that needs to be done in that area. And for that, because we, we don't feel confident in the simulations, we typically ignore it or put some sort of empirical aggravation factor. Uh, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done in that, in that area, I think. Uh, thank you, Professor, Professor Ellen Rade and others. Uh, now uh, it's time to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, on behalf of ISET, it's my pleasure and duty to propose a vote of thanks. We are honored to, uh, this evening by the presence of Professor Ellen Rade as chief guest and uh, 41st ISET annual speaker. We are thankful to you for kindly accepting our invitation and readily agreeing to deliver the lecture today. We fully appreciate you for sparing your valuable time and uh, sharing your rich research experience with all of us. Thank you, Professor Ellen Rathi. My sincere thanks to Professor uh, T.G. Sitaram, President ISET and Director IIT Gohati for his constant guidance and support in various affairs of ISET during the year. Even in organizing today's annual lecture, he has guided 
as in every stage in spite of his busy schedule thank you sir i extend thanks to professor bk maheshwari vice president i said and all the members of iset executive committee for their continuous support guidance and suggestions thank you one and all i am also thankful to iset staff mr pawan mr promo and my research scholar mr saiket kuli for helping me in organizing this event uh, we have recorded this event uh, uh, at the cloud as well as we streamed online uh, since uh, we received more than 500 registrations as our uh, zoom capacity allows only 500 we thought to stream on uh, youtube as well uh, that that is available if uh, speaker uh, our respected speaker allows us then we will uh, try to post it over our uh, website or maybe on the uh, iset youtube channel last but not least i extend thanks to all the students ladies and gentlemen for attending this uh, annual lecture which is in fact shows your keen interest in earthquake engineering i request all of you to become members of iset to actively take part in various other activities of the society iset uh, organizes uh, several activities from time to time iset uh, would be organizing seventh international conference on recent advances in geotechnical earthquake engineering and soil dynamics popularly known as the seven i crazy during uh, uh, 12 to 15 july 2021 uh professor uh, dg sitaram has already given uh, the background about uh, this conference it would be now organized on uh, online i i wanted to just uh, state here the one point that more than 30 uh, eminent speakers from outside uh, india and another 30 plus speakers uh, from india would be delivering keynotes state of art presentations and special lectures it would be a really wonderful opportunity to all of us to listen to them so uh, considering um, this wonderful opportunity i said and organizing committee of seven i crazy has reduced the participation uh, re, uh, for non others uh, registration fee has been reduced so i i request all uh, all of you to um, participate in the conference by registering and also iset has um, decided to give discount for the all the i um, seven i crazy registrants to become iset members for more information i request all of you to uh, have a look at our conference and iset website i thank you all once again have a nice evening before i uh, end this uh, meeting i have a small announcement for iset members 50th annual general body meeting uh, will be starting from uh, it's already 7:30 it's supposed to start at 7:30 so let us start after uh, maybe uh, 10 minutes like uh, 7:45 uh, please join uh, all the iset members uh, to kindly uh, express your opinions or uh, feedback on iset activities uh, thank you one and all thank you professor jakka for arranging so wonderful lecture thank you to you as well as professor sitaram for such a wonderful lecture thank you sir for your support and first of all we are thankful to professor alan radhi so for delivering such a nice lecture thank, thank you, you thank you and thank you for all the questions they're really good questions i was really excited so thank you again for the invitation have a great night bye bye thank you bye bye